Welcome friends, this is class number 31, and this is based on a talk called Be 100% Responsible by Lynn G. Robbins. So we're talking about agency and actually using our agency instead of giving up our agency, which means being accountable, being responsible for our choices and the circumstances in our lives, um, having an equal balance between mercy and justice, and um, we reap what we sow. Okay, lots of lots of great stuff. So let's just get to it. This is a long BYU speech. So I am going to be skipping over some of his examples and some of his stories. So I do recommend that if you want to learn more to read this speech in its entirety on your own. <clears throat> okay, so he starts with Doctrine and Covenants 5024, which is one of my favorites. I think I've quoted that before. He that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light. And he says the wicked one prevents people from, prog from progressing and receiving more light. Receiving more light is basically the recipe for how you become like God. And we came to this earth to use our agency. So when we use our agency, we receive light. And Satan wants to put a stop to that for sure. So the opposite of agency is being a victim, having no control, feeling powerless, and that, in effect, is a feeling of darkness. So agency begets light, and giving up your agency is darkness. So this was a really profound insight. He talks about how there are doctrinal pairs, things that go together. And Satan has a strategy. This is awesome because I've never thought of this. Satan has a strategy of dividing up the doctrinal pair and just taking one. So he's taking a true principle, but he's taking it out of context and away from the necessary partner. So the doctrinal pairs are agency and responsibility. See, Satan wants to give you free choice with no consequences. Mercy and justice. And Satan wants to give you lots of mercy and, and no consequences, no justice to that mercy. And then faith and works. A lot of people say, let's believe in God and just do whatever we want. We don't have to demonstrate our belief in God. Let's just believe in God. You need to go play. You need to go play. Please. <laughs> bye. Bye. Say bye. Thank bye. you. Elizabeth, you're on duty here. Sorry about that. Real life calls. Okay, so the two scriptures he quotes here are 2 Nephi 2.26, which says that um, Heavenly Father created two things, agents to act and agents to be acted upon. Now, we are supposed to be the agents to act, but sometimes we use that agency and we put ourselves in a position where we're agents to be acted upon, and then we're in trouble. And then 2 Nephi 10.23 <clears throat> Cheer up your hearts and remember that you're free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. So if we want the way of eternal life, it's not just going to happen naturally. We need to choose that. We need to actively we need to actively choose in like every single day. And we demonstrate that by our choices and by our attitude. Instead of being a victim, we take control and be responsible for our choices. Responsibility is to recognize ourselves at, as being the cause for the effects or the results of our choices, good or bad. So if you have, if you bear some awesome fruit in your life, let's say you've been working on a project and, it, and there's success, you want to take credit for that, right? You're like, yes, I planted those seeds and I reap the rewards. So what if it's the opposite and you have something in your life that's not going very well and something is failing in your life? Are we willing to say, I planted those seeds? And, you know, to what degree did we plant those seeds? Some things are beyond our control, but then do we take action with what is in our control? Or do we fall into victim mode and then we don't take any further action? We blame other people. We throw ourselves a pity party. We're going to cover more of that. So this is karma. That's not a Christian word, but we talk about it a lot. It is a Christian word. Jesus said, uh, 
do unto others as you would have others do to you. And there's something else. I should have been prepared with that. Put some, you know, you reap what you sow. Jesus said something on the Sermon of the Mount. And I remember because I always highlight it and write karma. Like we believe the same thing as those Hindus. Okay, so he talks about Korihor and Nihor, who were both antichrists. And I already did a full class on each of them. Go, go to classes four and five, and you'll learn about the antichrists. I think for class four is probably all about Zeezrom. So go to class five to learn about Korihor and Nihor. Korihor is in Alma 30, and Nihor is in Alma 1. Okay, one of Satan's most crafty strategies is to gain control of our agency. And it's not a frontal attack on our agency, but a sneaky backdoor assault on responsibility. Without responsibility, every good gift from God could be misused for evil purposes. For example, freedom of speech without responsibility can be used to create and protect pornography. The rights of a woman can be twisted to justify an unnecessary abortion. When the world separates choice from accountability, it leads to anarchy and a war of wills or survival of the fittest. We could call agency without responsibility the Korihor principle, as we read in the book of Alma, because he says, every man conquers according to his strength, and whatsoever a man does is no crime. So go do whatever you want. The world is your oyster. There's no good or bad. Do we hear a lot of that today? With negative consequences removed, you now have agency unbridled as if there were no day of reckoning. And now the Nihor principle, which is denying justice. He says, all mankind should be saved at the last day and they need not fear nor tremble for the Lord has created all men and he has also redeemed all men. And in the end, all men should have eternal life. That also denies agency because some people wouldn't choose on their own accord to have eternal life. But he's saying that this denies justice because it just gives free mercy to everybody without, without recognition to the law that says no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God. So how can God just save everybody in our sins? We cannot dwell in the presence of God. That is justice. So the beauty of the atonement is it satisfies mercy and justice. The atonement cleanses us from our sins so that we can fill the law of justice. A common strategy in each Book of Mormon Antichrist was to separate agency from responsibility. 2 Nephi 28.8 says, Eat, drink, and be merry. Nevertheless, fear God. He will justify in committing a little sin. So, like, it's okay. You can sin a little bit. There's no responsibility for your, for your choices. And that is an Antichrist teaching. Faith without works. Mercy without justice. And agency without responsibility are all different verses of the same seductive and damning song. With each, the natural man rejects accountability in an attempt to sedate his conscience. It is similar to the early 16th century practice of paying for indulgences. Uh, this was in the Catholic Church that people could pay money in, to receive forgiveness of their sins. If you weren't familiar with that. He says, but this way is much easier and it's free. You don't have to pay money. You just get free forgiveness <laughs> no matter what you do. The path parades a guilt-free journey to salvation, but it is in reality a cleverly disguised detour to destruction. See 3 Nephi 14, 13. And this is going to be the words of Christ, so that is why I like to turn to the, his words himself. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction. And many there be who go in there, very, I don't know that word. But there are many people who go on the road to destruction. And why do they do that, you wonder? Do they do it because they want destruction? And they're like, oh yeah, this is awesome. No, I mean, they do it because they don't realize what road they're on. They listen to the seductive voices that say that this is a good road and it works for them. It fulfills their hedonistic desires and they're on that road. And before they know it, I mean, before they realize where that road leads to, they're trapped. They're trapped in addiction and they can't overcome the natural man to the extent that they have given into it. I mean, without a lot of help and severe repentance and coming to the Savior. Okay, the anti-responsibility list. I can't go into each of these. You'll have to look at the talk to if you don't understand. So, but we have blaming, rationalizing or justifying, making excuses, 
Minimalizing or trivializing sin. Hiding. Number six is covering up. Fleeing from responsibility. Abandoning responsibility. Uh, and the, the example of that is Corianton, because Corianton, the son of Alma, abandoned his ministry in pursuit of the harlot Isabel. And we are going to go to that chapter, uh, I, I think, right? Corianton is in Alma 39. Okay, number nine, denying or lying. Number 10, rebelling. Number 11, complaining and murmuring. 12, fault finding and getting angry. Number 13, making demands and entitlements. 14, doubting, losing hope, giving up, and quitting. 15, indulging in self-pity and a victim mentality. 16, being decisive or being in a spiritual stupor. 17, procrastinating. 18, allowing fear to rule. 15, enabling. Okay, so several of these apply to Laman and Lemuel, and I thought this would be a good time for this talk because a lot of us are back in First Nephi to follow the Prophet's challenge. So I and so I just said this is like the entire book of First Nephi. You look at the cycles and the patterns and what Laman and Lemuel do and what's their attitude and do they ever take responsibility for any of their choices? Do they ever use their agency? Or they're just they're just a total reactor. They're just being acted upon and blaming other people and whining and complaining. And they're not ever like standing up and saying, "I'm a child of God. I can create something. I can I can create my own attitude. I can decide my response to this." And and taking that power. But that's exactly what Nephi does. Nephi says, "I don't have to be angry. I don't have to be sorrowful because of the afflictions. I can decide my my mental state." I can decide how I respond to adversity. So we learn a lot from Nephi. So here, um, finding fault and getting angry. It came to pass that Laman was angry with me and also my father, as was Lemuel. I mean, Laman and Lemuel are angry with Nephi multiple times, right? And, and Nephi didn't do anything wrong. But they find fault and they pin it all on Nephi. Making demands and entitlements. We will not that our younger brother shall be a ruler over us. And Laman and Lemuel did take me and bind me with cords, and they did treat me with harshness. 14. Doubting, losing hope, giving up, and quitting. Our brother is a fool, for they did not believe that I could build a ship. Indulging in self-pity and a victim mentality. These many years we have suffered in the wilderness, which time we might have enjoyed our possessions and the land of our inheritance. We might have been happy. So I was wondering, do Laman and Lemuel, sometimes they seem to exhibit some faith, like they say, okay, okay, we repent, we'll be good. But the, the, the multiple repentance, and it's like empty repentance, it's empty because their actions never back it up. I mean, the next time that they have an opportunity to fall into victim mode, then they, they do the sin all over again, right? So there's no works there. There's faith, and it's not even a very substantial faith but it's not backed up by any works. So the victim mentality, I just wanted to share with you guys this book I'm reading for a class that I'm taking called The Power of Ted. And uh, Ted, T-E-Ed, stands for the Empowerment Dynamic. And this is all about this victim triangle that there's a victim, there's a persecutor, and there's a rescuer. And sometimes the rescuer is inanimate and it's like uh, an addiction or distraction, uh, overeating, you know, numbing our emotions. The rescuer is anything that can rescue you from um, the emotions that you don't want to feel when you're in a victim mentality and you blame everything on the persecutor. So this book is about escaping the victim mentality and it's been very helpful for me, for sure. I mean, I'm reading it for my class, but it was exactly what I needed to read. And I know this stuff. I've talked about this lots of times. I believe this stuff, but I still fall into the trap of victim mentality. So we all need to remind ourselves of this multiple times. Okay, difficult situations are the test of one's faith to see if we will go forward with either a believing heart or a doubting heart, if at all. A difficult situation reveals a person's character and either strengthens it, as with Nephi, or weakens and corrupts it, as with Laman and Lemuel. And I've heard this before because Becky Edwards, I did her course, she says that if we're a piece of fruit, um, when we're squeezed under pressure, the juice that comes out reveals 
our true nature. It reveals what fruit we are. So we can dress ourselves up and we can look like a nice tasty orange, but when we get squeezed under pressure, if lemon juice comes out, we're a lemon and we're more sour than we wanted to admit. And maybe I didn't like that analogy because I was like, I get pretty nasty when the pressure is on me. So maybe I didn't like being called out. And so if that's you too, don't say, well, okay, I guess I'm hopeless. I guess I'm just sour. But let's say, you know what? I'm going to try again. And next time the pressure gets put on me, I want to choose. I want to use my agency and choose to be proactive. And I want to choose to be a creator rather than a victim. And this book talks about how to be a creator. Um, in class number 29, it's called Thy Trials to Bless. Is that what it's called? <laughs> Something like that. Um, it, we, we talk a lot about this, about how some trials don't have an easy answer. And it's our trial for our, for our entire life. And it's basically our test. Will we still praise God? Will we still choose Jesus Christ? Even when he didn't rescue us from our problems. But we have hope that that deliverance will come even in the next life. And in that class, class number 29, we read the words to the song, How Firm a Foundation. And the song ends, it has like seven verses. And the very last line is when you're affirming Regardless of what happens in my life, I will never, no, never, no, never, no, never. I will never forsake, will never forsake Jesus Christ. So I hope that you can make that commitment today and say, even, even if Jesus doesn't manifest himself and show me signs and show me tender mercies and back me up in everything I do, even when he leaves me seemingly alone, because that's my test. And you know, like when it's time to take the test, the teacher doesn't answer the student's questions. <laughs> Um, I hope that you make the commitment today that Jesus is your Lord and you will trust him and you will hold on to your hope for eternal promises, even if it doesn't look like they're coming today. And we also have that class. Is it class number 23? Um, uh, don't forget the promises of the Lord or holding out for those promises. The reason Nephi obtained the plates and Laman and Lemuel didn't is because Nephi went, he never went to the anti-responsibility list. So those, that number of things that we just went over is the anti-responsibility list. Elder David B. Haight said, a determined man finds a way, the other man finds an excuse. If the anti-responsibility list is so dangerous, why do so many people frequently turn to it? Because a natural man is irresponsible by nature. He goes to the list as a defense mechanism to avoid shame and embarrassment, stress and anxiety, and the pain and the negative consequences of mistakes and sin. The anti-responsibility list could also be called the anti-faith list because it halts progress dead in its tracks. When Satan tempts a person to avoid responsibility, that person subtly surrenders their agency because a person is no longer in control or acting. Instead, they are being acted upon. And Satan cleverly begins to control their life. So this taught me, my big takeaway was that this plan of salvation, it all hinges on agency. And surrendering our agency puts us under Satan's control. How do you make sure that agency is first and foremost in your life and you're using that power? You use it by making choices every day. So whenever we get in a rut and we're like, I'm just kind of doing what I'm supposed to do in life, um, that's dangerous. Set a goal and you decide what kind of person do you want to be one year from now? What's something you want to change? What's something you want to change physically? What's something you want to change mentally? Do you want to increase your vocabulary? Do you want to be more well-read? What's something you want to change emotionally? What's something you want to change spiritually? Do you want to read the entire Book of Mormon by the end of the year? Uh, decide who you want to be and use your agency to set up your day, set up your week, arrange your time, take out meaningless things in your life, and move forward using your power to become that person that you want to be. We can't just go on autopilot and let life happen to us because then we're being agents to be acted upon. Okay, I'm gonna skip his two stories. The second one's about marriage, so I'm gonna sum this up. In marriage, a 50% attitude on both parts may seem logical, but only a 100% attitude on both parts closes the door to the anti-responsibility list. And marriage is such an awesome school, isn't it? Because it seems like it should be 50-50. So you're like, well, I'm doing my part, but you're not doing your part. So it's so easy to, to go into blame and say, this situation is because your part did not happen. 
So it says then the only way to close a door on the anti-responsibility list, which is complaining, feeling like a victim, blaming, self-pity, and making excuses, hiding, da da da. The only way is for you to take 100%. And that doesn't mean that you have to do everything and your spouse gets off scot-free. But you take, you're willing to be 100% responsible. So you're in any situation you find, what can I do? Did I have any part to play in this? Even if I didn't have a part to play in this, what can I do now? What are my choices? What responsibility can I take? A loving mother once gave the following wise counsel to her daughter, who was unhappy with a struggling marriage. She had the daughter draw a vertical line down the middle of a sheet of paper and write down on the left side all the things her husband did that bothered her. And then on the right side, she had her write down her response to each offense. The mother then had her cut the paper in half, separating the two lists. She said, now throw away the paper with your husband's faults in the garbage. If you want to be happy and improve your marriage, stop focusing on your husband's faults and focus instead on your own behavior, on your reactions. Examine the way you are responding to the things that bother you and see if you can respond in a different, more positive way. This mother understood the power and the wisdom of 100% responsibility. Okay, so that reminds me of, I'm looking around to see if I have the book close by, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, when he says, be proactive, not reactive. So if we, if our husband has a certain fault and we are reacting to that fault in the way the natural man would, then we're not using our agency. But instead, if we say, okay, I, can, I see that he has this fault, I am going to choose forgiveness. Or I am going to choose to see the good or to let something go and be the bigger person. Or I'm going to choose, you know, if my husband doesn't want to go to church and I do, it's all on me to get the kids ready and bring them to church. But I am going to, to stand by that choice and say, yep, I decide I want to go to church. It's my choice whether I want to go to church or not. And I can't blame my husband for leaving me with the responsibility of getting kids ready. Because I'm the one who chooses to go to church. Or whatever the situation is. So be proactive and take the responsibility. I mean, make a list of statements. And I choose, da da da. And that's a really good exercise if you want to say, I have to, da da da. Change it to I choose. Because you do, right? And if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. So whenever we say, I have to do this, we're saying that it's something we don't want to do. But if you don't want to do it, then don't. I mean, what did that just say? Lift up your hearts and be glad and cheer up for your you're free to choose for yourselves, right? So what's something maybe I, maybe I would say my husband just sits on the couch and watches sports and I have to do all the housework Well, you don't have to you, you can have a messy house You can sit on the couch and watch sports too and just let the dishes and the laundry pile up and live in filth or you could be like, you know what? so it's just like considering the circumstances that my husband's not going to contribute and it's on me, what are my choices? I could choose to negate all responsibility also and have a messy house. Or I could choose to say, you know what? I want a clean house. I desire a clean house. And if I want that, then I will do what it takes to have it. Uh, regardless of the obstacles, regardless of who's with me or against me, it, I'm just going to get that done. I'm going to find a way. And maybe it's delegating or being creative and hiring and help or multitasking and listening to your favorite audios while you're cleaning. Just find a way to enjoy it. Find a way to stand by that choice and say, I choose this because this is something I want. All right. Of course, he goes into Jesus. Jesus Christ was the greatest example of, of not giving into that anti-responsibility list. And I would even call that meekness. Being meek is following God and living righteously and being 100% an agent of, of choice and not giving into that victim mentality. It says, his compassion for others does not nullify his expectation that we would be fully responsible and never try to minimize or justify sin. For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. If the Lord cannot look upon sin with the, even the least degree of allowance, what law of the gospel demands complete and full responsibility for sin? That would be the law of justice. Emma 42, 25. What, do you suppose that mercy can rob justice? I say unto you, nay, not one whit. If so, God would cease to be God. O oh, my son, I desire, this is verse 30, I desire that you should deny the justice of God no more. 
Do not endeavor to excuse yourself in the least point because of your sins by denying the justice of God. But do you let the justice of God and his mercy and his long suffering have full sway in your heart and let it bring you down to the dust in humility. So God holds his children 100% responsible for the use of their agency. The danger of the anti-responsibility list consists in the fact that it blinds its victims to the need for repentance. Ah, there's exactly why Satan wants us to use that list. Because if we don't accept that we have any responsibility, then we won't repent. And then we are in his power. Laman and Lemuel, for example, didn't see a need to repent because it was all Nephi's fault. If it's not my fault, then why should I repent? The one blinded can't even take the first step in the repentance process, which is to recognize the need for repentance. So using your agency correctly means you can live up to your part that you played in the situation. And sometimes the part we played is only in our attitude. But you know what Jesus did on the Sermon of the Mount is he took external sin and he brought it internal. So we are responsible for our feelings. We're responsible for our, our thoughts and our attitude. So Mosiah 430 says, I, this much I can tell you that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and the intents of your heart, it doesn't say that, but your actions, then you must perish. So um, I really like this because it reminded me of when I was little and I would have fights with my big brother. And um, I remember multiple times my mom would say, okay, this is an allegation against you. Did you do this to him? And he would say, yes. And I just remember being in shock. Like, you're not going to argue. You're not going to defend yourself. You're just going to admit that you hurt me. <laughs> so he would admit it. And then he would say, and this is what she did. Or this is why I was feeling that way. So he, he had a really good way of communicating. And it was like he was just guileless. Like, guileless is the word to say. And, and meek. Like, it, when the question is placed upon you, are you guilty? Did you do this? It's a yes no question. It doesn't require a long excuse. So da, 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 da. Just say, yes, I did that. I did that and it was wrong. You know. So my brother was a really good example to me in that. Helaman 5.10 The Lord surely should come to redeem his people, but that he should not come to redeem them in their sins, but redeem them from their sins. And that is why we need to be accountable for what we do and go to the Lord for forgiveness. We can't stay in our sins. If we stay in our sins, we will be in Satan's power. Okay, two ways to deny the Lord's justice. Satan successfully divides the complementary principles of mercy and justice when a person succumbs to the temptation to deny the Lord's justice. Denying the Lord's justice comes in at least two forms. The first we already mentioned is to deny the law of justice in regard to one's own sins something both Korhor and Nihor advocated. So it's to say, there is no such thing as sin. I can do whatever I want. God won't hold me accountable. That's denying Lord's justice. And the second way is denying or not trusting in the Lord's justice when it comes to dealing with other people and the injustices that others have perpetrated against us. He tells the story of the Count of Monte Cristo when this man took justice into his own hands and, and ruined his life. And I really love his explanation why. Uh, refusal. Oh, because when we deny the Lord's justice for others, we unwittingly deny the Lord's mercy for ourselves. Because what you're saying is you deny a third-party payment to pay you. You're saying, this person wronged me. Uh, I, I deserve a payment here. And you're denying Jesus from paying you. You're, you're being bitter and you're holding onto that grudge, waiting for the person, the perpetrator, to pay you. So you're denying the Lord's mercy. So it's not amazing that we're holding on to something and we're not letting the Lord pay that ransom. He, he wants to pay that for us. And we're like, no, thanks. I'd rather go unpaid because I want it to come from him. So I'm just going to let it go unpaid and let this eat away at me and remain bitter for the rest of my life. <laughs> so can't we see the folly in that? People try to reconcile this injustice gap in many ways through seeking revenge, justifying their anger and bitterness, or seeking legal redress and imposed consequences. We ultimately discover that the Lord's way is the only way for true and complete reconciliation. The error of Dante was not necessarily seeking redress and justice according to the law of the land and bringing devious facts to the light with appropriate penalties for the guilty, but in letting his desire for justice turn to hatred anger, self-pity, self-justification, and other disabling behaviors on the anti-responsibility list. 
He essentially descended to his enemy's level of ungodliness, and he used deceptions, lies, and fraud to entrap them. By relying on the law of Moses, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, rather than on the law of the gospel, including forgiving and praying for one's enemies, Dante imposed a life sentence of misery and bitterness upon himself. In denying the Lord's justice for others, he unwittingly denied the Lord's mercy for himself and chose to serve the sentence that Christ had already served in his behalf. So Christ already served in his behalf, and he was like, no, I'm just going to serve it. <laughs> it robbed him of a life of happiness that could have been his had he accepted the, the Lord's payment. And, and all for the want of revenge. Having faith in Jesus Christ is to trust that because of his atoning sacrifice, he will correct all injustices, restore all things lost, and mend all things broken, including hearts. He will make all things right, not leaving any detail unattended. As hard as forgiving may be in such situations, not forgiving is even harder over the long run because it puts a person on the disabling anti-responsibility list. Not forgiving is a synonym with blaming, anger, self-justifying, and self-pity all things that are on this list. When Satan taps into any of these negative emotions, he begins exercising control over a person's life. So I guess I want to res uh, bear my responsibility of this concept here because I've been going through a situation when I was very much like this character. I don't know if I'm saying his name right, Dante in The Count of Monte Cristo. And, and I had a plan executed for justice and it seemed very fair. I was obsessed with, with what is fair and I wanted to enact what is fair and what is just and my husband once when I was uh, talking to him he teared up and he says I feel impressed as your steward to warn you that if you go down that route if you go down that road you will regret it and it was very hard for me not to go down that road and to and to change my heart and I guess I'm thankful for that situation. I've never been in a situation in my life. I mean, I've been wronged lots of times, but usually I'm a pretty forgiving person. And in this situation, I was just so consumed and obsessed with the idea of justice. And justice is a good law, so I thought I was justified, right? But I need to look and see, um, hey, I deserve, I deserve something here. And Jesus wants to give it to me. Jesus, as a third-party payer, wants to provide what is due to me. And I have the choice to accept that or to remain unpaid. Why would I want to do that? Of course, I want to accept the third-party payment. And then whatever happens on the other party's behalf, that's in God's hands. And I need to trust God and allow him to hold the cards of justice. Because, I mean, I've just been miserable. It's been eating away at me. And I was like, I'm praying and I thought I was making good choices here, but I don't have peace. And that's how I knew something was still wrong. I wasn't using all the principles of the gospel because I didn't have peace. And through reading this book, guys, this is an awesome book. <laughs> and through studying my scriptures, because the answer came in the scriptures, where I realized I am missing the bigger picture. And I need to let go of of this obsession with what is right. And I'll tell you the what the scripture was that changed my heart. And I talk about this in my cover to cover series um, with this in this section of the beginning of 2 Nephi. I, I think it was 2 Nephi chapter five, verse eight. And that's when Laban and Lemuel say, we will not allow our brother to be a, a ruler over us. No, because it is not just, it is not fair. We are the older brothers. We will not allow him to be our older brother. And as a result, they missed out. They missed out on the blessings of the promised land. They didn't prosper and they didn't have peace. All the blessings that Nephi's posterity got because they obeyed this law, Laman and Lemuel gave up those blessings because they were so fixated on this that they missed the bigger picture. And that verse touched me so deeply. I really don't want to forego any of the blessings that the Lord wants to give me. So I need to allow him to hold the cards of justice and uh, I just put that away and focus on the bigger picture and receive that light in my heart. Okay. Justice is an eternal law that requires a penalty each time a law of God is broken. And if you want to read more about that, go to Alma 42. The sinner must repay the penalty if he does not repent. That's in Mosiah chapter 2, 30 and 39. And I actually want to look this up because I'm not familiar with what verse he's referring to.
Therefore, if that man repenteth not, and remaineth and dieth an enemy to God, the demands of divine justice do awaken his immortal soul to a lively sense of his own guilt, which doth cause him to shrink from the presence of the Lord, and doth fill his breast with guilt and pain and anguish, which is like an unquenchable fire, whose flame ascendeth up for ever and ever. And now I say unto you that mercy hath no claim on that man. Therefore his final doom is to endure a never-ending torment. If he does repent, the Savior pays a penalty through the atonement, which invokes mercy. The law of mercy, that's in Alma 34, 16. And I will include a list of all these scriptures. Okay, Mormon 820. Man shall not smite, neither shall he judge, for judgment is mine, saith the Lord, and vengeance is mine also, and I will repay. Isn't it funny how we talk about forgiveness our entire lives, and we're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know all this. And then we're put in the situation, and we're like, oh, but it's so hard. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not fun and games, and it's not as easy as it is when we just talk about it, when we're in that situation. That's like the most painful situation that, that you know, the most painful lesson to learn in this life. Let me show you another book. The Little Soul in the Sun, this is about premortal agreements and when, and this isn't a Christian book, but, but we believe, so it's the same type of stuff that we believe, so you can get a lot out of this, but um, this little soul before he comes to earth says, I want to learn the lesson of forgiveness, and one of his best friends says, stands forth a volunteer because he says, I want to learn the lesson of forgiveness, okay, who's going to teach me this lesson? And one of his friends says, I'll teach it to you. And he says, but, you know, I forget the exact deal they come upon. But his friend says, in order for me to teach you the lesson of forgiveness, I, I cannot show my true colors. I cannot show that I'm your friend. I have to pretend to be your enemy. And it's just so beautiful that we, through our weaknesses, we are doing each other a favor. So we can learn these lessons. So we can ultimately come back to God and become as he is. So this is where that agency comes in is we can choose to be thankful for what we're going through and be thankful because as we're trudging up this uphill battle, like, oh, it's so uphill. I mean, it's so steep. I have to go further and further. And it's so hard. And I'm so tired. Where, where, where is this hill leading to? It's leading to Godhood. And Godhood is so high, so far above us, that yes, it is a very steep hill. And we have to climb a steep hill to get there. But we want to get there, right? So we're thankful for this mountain. We're thankful for our feet. That our feet and our legs can push us and we can get up this mountain. And so let's be thankful for that journey. So a caveat on forgiveness here and we'll finish up. Part of understanding forgiveness is to understand what it is not. Forgiving her husband, this is about her abusive husband, does not excuse or condone his cruelty. Forgiving does not mean forgetting his brutality. You cannot unremember or erase a memory that is so traumatic. Forgiving does not mean that justice is being denied because mercy cannot rob justice. That's a really interesting thing about the scripture saying mercy cannot rob justice. So when we show mercy to another person, don't worry, justice still will be met. It will just be met by somebody else. You're going to allow the third party to take care of that. Forgiving does not erase the injury he has caused, but it can begin to heal the wounds and ease the pain. Forgiving does not mean trusting him again and giving him yet another chance to abuse her and the children. While to forgive is a commandment, trust has to be earned and evidenced by good behavior over time, which he clearly has not demonstrated. Forgiving does not mean forgiveness of his sins. Only the Lord can do that based upon sincere repentance. Forgiveness does not mean giving him another chance to abuse, but it does mean giving him another chance at the plan of salvation. And that's so beautiful because if we condemn someone, what we're saying is your chance is over. You will never be able to become a God, you know, so you might as well just die because because you're done, you know, but we give him another chance at the plan of salvation because we believe in repentance Right? We believe that all of us are, are sons and daughters of Heavenly Father. And we all have the potential to become as He is and the opportunity to repent of our sins so that we can become like He is. So when we forgive people, we give them another chance at the plan of salvation. Conclusion. In summary, being 100% responsible is accepting yourself as a person in control of your life. I am in control of my life. 
Agency and responsibility are inseparably connected. You cannot avoid responsibility without also diminishing agency. Mercy and justice are also inseparable. You cannot deny the Lord's justice without also impeding his agency. Oh, how Satan loves to divide complementary principles and laugh at the resulting devastation. The day a person eliminates the list from their life is the day they regain control over positive outcomes from that point on. And they begin moving forward in the light at an accelerated pace. So remember where we started with DNC 5024. That as you receive light and continue within God, you will then receive more and more light. And that light is using the, the power of agency. So as we tap into that agency and let ourselves be proactive instead of reactive and let and get out of the victim mindset, you will begin to move forward in the light at an accelerated pace. So it's like an extra rocket fuel to boost you up that hill towards God, Godhood and receiving all of that light that our Heavenly Father has. So I bear my testimony that the plan of salvation is such a beautiful design. It's such a beautiful gift for us. And that includes these laws, mercy and justice and letting God have the vengeance. Um, and agency is the way to tap into all of that power and potential in the plan of salvation. And if we don't use our agency, we're just kind of giving it up. We're just saying, all right, go on without me. And we're not taking advantage of this life. We have only one life to live, right? So what will you do with it? What's the quote at the very beginning of this book? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? You have one life to live, and it's in your hands. You take responsibility for your future and make it a great one. And I bear my testimony that that is the way to joy, and that is the way to find God and to feel connected with God and to have him with you. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a good day, everybody. I'll see you next time.